Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB Foundation Level Certification. We are in chapter 1 and we are done with all the tutorials of this particular chapter but shall be looking forward to have discussions on some of the sample questions from this chapter to understand how exactly the expected questions look like and what could be the best way to tackle them to get to the right answers. Well, to get started with the very first question we have here on the screen is to talk about that which of the following statements describe a valid test objective. Now, we must at this point recall quickly that what exactly are those common test objectives which we have with respect to the test specifications and we must look forward to recall them in order to get the right answer. Number one and most important tip at this point of time I would like to share is always try to get your answer first within your mind from your learnings and then look at the options because sometimes the options are a little tricky and if you start reading the options without bringing in your own result you may get confused and get to the wrong answer also. So it is very important that you look forward to start talking about your learnings first and once you have some conclusion in your mind then look at the options. So write the options here are option A to prove that there are no unfixed defects in the system under test. I think that's a contradictory statement with respect to principle number one. The principle one said that testing is just to show the presence of defect but cannot prove the absence of defect and that certainly becomes a big challenge to say as one of the objective of testing. It's not one of the objective of testing and certainly cannot be taken for granted always. So the second option what we have is option B and that option B is talking about to prove that there will be no failures after the implementation of system into production. Now after, that is like when we talk about the absence of error fallacy, it is of course something which we are trying to build up, but it may not be something which I can go and promise you that the failures will not result into any kind of drawbacks. So if you look into the statement right here, it clearly says that to prove that there will be no failures after the system, which is again contradicting with our principle one and principle seven as well. Principle seven in the sense like absence of error fallacy, I may just find and fix defects, but if the requirements are not fulfilled, it may not make any sense. So as far as I have met the requirements, I may not go and tell you that what other failures will happen. But if in case anything happens, I cannot be assured or confident about that that will not result into a failure. So I cannot make any such statement as one of the key objectives of testing when I talk about that. Option C, when we are talking about here, we have to reduce the risk level of the test object and to build confidence in the quality level. That certainly is one of the key objectives what we have discussed and learned about that as a part of testing, we try to First of all, of course, we have risk identification process taking place, which helps us to identify the risk areas and then proportionate amount of testing is being conducted to mitigate those risks. Sometimes we don't just mitigate everything, but we do bring down the level of risk and certainly to gain confidence about the quality of the product, right? So that's one of the key objectives, but just cross check with option D. The option D is saying to verify that there are no untested combination of inputs I think uh, contradicting with principle number two, principle number two says exhaustive testing is impossible. And there we say that we cannot just try everything a set of combinations in order to test a particular scenario. So that's not something which is very, very straightforward to say that you have to check that there are no untested combinations because there would be many as we do not test everything what comes into the permutation and combination. So in that context, when we look at all the four options once again the right answer here is c to reduce the risk level of test objects and to build confidence in the quality level is one of the valid objectives of testing well looking on the next question the question number two what we have here for you is you have been assigned as a tester to a team producing a new system incrementally you have noticed that no changes have been made to existing regression test cases for a several iteration and no new regression defects were identified. Your manager is happy, but you are not. Which testing principle explains your skepticism? 
Now, of course, I think we are pretty much aware what exactly is being discussed, but I don't want to give you that straightforward. Rather, assume that even I'm not sure what exactly they're talking about. The most important thing we are they're discussing in this particular question is number one, that they are referring to things which are following a methodology of agile. And second important thing, they highlighted that your existing regression test cases or regression test suite has not been revised over a period of time. And I think right at this point, I should quickly come back to the principles of testing and should think about one of the principles which talks about tests wear out, which clearly talks about that pesticide paradox. That means you, there's no point using the same test cases again and again as far as the product evolves over a period of time. So as the code is changing every single iteration because the methodology is agile, every single sprint new code is being added. It is certainly something which I should keep revising over a period of time. A manager may be happy is just a diversion for you. Sometimes some statements you do find which are just a tricky one to give you a diversion so that you start thinking about it rather than concentrating on the answer. So let the manager be happy because we are progressing well, but even if that doesn't happen, I don't care about it because they are talking about the principles here, not about who should be happy, right? So in that context, I think the things which comes to our mind is the pesticide paradox and also called as test wear out. So let's quickly check out which option is that. And on, I think we would have already got the answer here. So we have option A, tests wear out, which is pesticide paradox. B, absence of error fallacy. C, defects cluster together. D, exhaustive testing is impossible. And I think we have already discussed what should be the right answer here. So the right answer is A, tests wear out is the right principle what we are talking about when it comes to revision of test cases, especially the regression test suite. Moving on to the next question, which is question number three. And here we are talking about another situation which is talking from the perspective of the test process context and the factors influencing that. So the question says, which of the following factors, that is first to five, have significant influence on the test process? So here we need to just consider those important things which will significantly, that means more importantly being concerned towards the test process influencement, right? So maybe sometime you will get those options which are pretty much look correct, but when the word significant is used, uh, it must be considered from the perspective of that, you know, which are the important ones, not everything. So in that context, let's have a look on the five steps here. So we have the first one as the SDLC. Of course, that's one of the key criteria which drive your test process. Two, the number of defects detected in previous project. That could be a good reference for us, but not necessarily uh, something which influenced the test process because entire testing is all about... Uh, Finding defects, so the number of defects detected in previous projects may have some influence, but not something which drives the overall process. So significantly, that's not something what I would take into account. Not I, everyone should not take that into account. Number three, the identified product risk. Of course, that's a key contributor to overall test process because as far as you have the product risk identified, you need to look forward to mitigate them as much as possible so it's a key factor to take into account to define your test process, which we'll be looking forward to mitigate them. And when I talk about number four, the new regulatory requirements forcing formal white box testing. Now that's another interesting thing, which is uh, number four. It is the regulatory requirement without which, if in case you fail to fulfill these regulatory contractual and standard driven requirements, then maybe your product may not go live and that could be a big challenge for the organization at the end of the day. So yes, I should consider that also as one of the parameter. And fifth, the test environment setup. I think the test environment setup is something which basically happens as a part of the requirement of the business and the product, and that has nothing to drive your test process. So it does not have significant influence as a part of the process, but yes, it is one of the activity which we do conduct, but it does not drive the test process as such, right? So in that context put together, we have four options. So option A says one and two have significant influence. No, two is not considered as one of the relevant one. B, one, three, four looks correct. C, two, four and five can be ruled out. And D, three and five can be ruled out. So I think put together, the right answer here is 
B where it is saying first, third and fourth which means the SDLC, the identified product risk and the regulatory requirements are certainly one of the significant contributors from the given list. Of course, we do have many, but from the given list, these are the three items which are significantly going to influence your test process. So that's all from these sample questions team. Of course, we do know there are many others. So we'll be creating a separate playlist later after this to guide you with all other sample questions with explanation. But for now, these three papers are, these three sample questions are just enough. So you should get an idea from here. More importantly, the knowledge is more significant to get to the right answer. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning. Thank you.